If you think of elephants as only having upward curving tusks, think again. Millions of years ago, a giant called Dinotherium dominated the forests with a completely different weapon, a powerful pair of downward curving tusks that grew from its lower jaw. This creature, which lived across Europe, Asia and Africa, challenged every definition of an elephant we know. This is the story of how a unique animal defied all the rules and how scientists finally solved its mystery. The very name Dinotherium, meaning terrible beast, set the stage for a reputation it never really earned. To early researchers in the 19th century, this massive herbivore looked like a crude prototype of the elephant family outfitted with tusks that seemed clumsy or even threatening. The unusual anatomy quickly became a source of speculation, and for decades, the name reinforced an image of a destructive giant that never quite matched what the fossils were actually saying. Scientists did recognize that Dinotherium belonged in the order Proboscidea, relatives of elephants, but its anatomy didn't match the expectations they had formed from living species. Some reconstructions even cast it as an aquatic animal, suggesting the downward pointing tusks were used to rake the bottoms of rivers or lakes. Others proposed that the tusks served as digging tools, good for hauling up roots or tearing at shrubs, which fit neatly with the terrible beast label. There were even ideas that it anchored itself to the seafloor with its tusks drifting like a giant serenian. All of these explanations found their way into museum displays and books for many years, but several lines of evidence slowly undercut those early ideas. Dinotherium's limbs are columnar and built to support its enormous weight over long distances, more like pillars than digging levers. They lack the reinforced shoulders and forelimb mechanics you would expect in an animal regularly tearing through soil or rock. That distinction weakens the classic digging hypothesis substantially. The shape of the tusks also made little sense for heavy excavation. The curved tips would have been more likely to snag or crack than to efficiently loosen dirt. The tusks themselves provided an even clearer answer. They didn't sprout from the upper jaw like in modern elephants, but from the lower incisors, a reversal that had confused researchers for years. And importantly, the wear is concentrated along their medial and rear faces. Instead of the grinding abrasion you would expect from soil contact, these surfaces show polishing and scarring consistent with pulling or scraping against vegetation. That evidence points toward feeding behaviors, not burrowing. Imagine the animal moving through a forest using the downward curving hooks to strip bark drag down branches or peel away fibrous layers of trees. In this light, the terrible beast looks less like a lumbering earth plow and more like a highly specialized browser that manipulated trees to its advantage. The name survived, but the myth it suggested gradually collapsed under closer study. So if not a plow, what did those tusks actually do? And how did the rest of the head support that behavior When paleontologists turned their attention from the tusks to the head itself, the biggest puzzle became the trunk. For decades, reconstructions swung between two extremes. Some showed Dinotherium with a tiny tapir-like snout, while others gave it a sweeping elephant-length proboscis. Neither version seemed to fit comfortably with the anatomy. A trunk too short would have made feeding and drinking impractical, but the case for a full elephant-style version also lacked convincing support. That uncertainty left scientists to search for answers in the skull's architecture. The skull gave the clearest clues. Dinotherium's cranium was broad and relatively flat on top, not domed like that of modern elephants. What stood out most was the large, retracted nasal opening. In living proboscideans, such a feature corresponds to a substantial trunk, not a mere lip extension. Researchers now view this as evidence for a robust muscular trunk that differed in structure and attachment from modern elephants, but was far more than a tapir-like snout. 
Arguments for a very short nose now seem weak, especially since the animal's great height at the shoulder would have demanded a trunk long enough to reach water efficiently. The challenge of drinking makes a short trunk highly questionable. Standing over four meters tall, Deinotherium would have struggled to reach surface water using only its mouth and neck. As some researchers point out, sprawling awkwardly to drink would have been both risky and inefficient. This suggests a functional trunk of intermediate length, long enough to siphon water from the ground, but perhaps not as elongated as the flexible appendage of present day elephants. Feeding behavior provides another part of the answer. Fossil wear on the tusks indicates browsing higher vegetation, not grazing at the ground. Combined with skull proportions, these points toward a strategy aimed upward into the tree canopy. Here, the anatomy of the neck comes into play. Unlike modern elephants, Deinotherium carried a somewhat longer and more mobile neck. When paired with a moderately long trunk, this gave the animal an effective combined reach, not giraffe-like in neck length and not elephant-like in trunk length, but a middle ground that achieved the same purpose. Muscle attachment sites reinforce the picture. Prominent markings on the skull indicate the presence of powerful facial muscles. These would only make sense if they supported a trunk capable of dexterous movement. A short, rigid snout would not require such muscular strength. Instead, the evidence points to an appendage able to strip foliage pull branches and assist in manipulating food tasks consistent with the wear patterns already seen on tusks. Imagining the animal in action helps connect these parts. A towering Dinotherium could position its head with its lengthened neck and then employ its muscular trunk to grasp and draw in branches. Downward curving tusks helped strip bark or snag vegetation just within reach with the trunk completing the job by delivering food to the mouth. Rather than exaggerating a single feature, the animal's design worked as a balanced system, longer neck, moderate trunk, and specialized tusks combining into a highly effective forest browsing strategy. The mystery of the trunk also links closely to its unusual skull shape. Juvenile fossils show how this flat topped cranium developed and hint that soft tissue structures were changing throughout growth. That raised a new question for paleontologists. If the head and feeding apparatus were already so specialized, how did the defining tusks and other features first appear in the young? The real turning point in understanding Dinotherium came from a discovery in southern Germany. At Hammerschmiede, a fossil rich site about 11.5 million years old, paleontologists uncovered something extraordinary. The partial skeleton of a juvenile Dinotherium preserved well enough to study its jaw in detail. This site had already yielded a remarkable diversity of Miocene life from early apes to carnivores to other elephant relatives. But this single specimen provided one of the clearest insights yet into how Deinotheres actually grew. Inside the juvenile's lower jaw, scientists found both sets of tusks preserved together. There were the small deciduous or milk lower tusks used in early life and behind them deep in the bone, the developing permanent tusks still waiting to erupt. Only three such records exist worldwide for Dinotheres, making this a discovery of rare importance. Equally significant, the permanent tusks appeared at a very early stage of development, even while the milk set was still complete, a growth pattern strikingly similar in timing to living elephants. Suddenly, a long-standing debate had evidence young Deinotheres did not pass through a long tuskless stage, nor were they born with miniature full tusks, but instead followed a measured replacement sequence. This ontogenetic detail helped resolve one of the more puzzling aspects of how Deinotheres lived. With their first set of tusks, juveniles likely managed lighter browsing tasks, relying more on their trunks and regular teeth. As their bodies grew and the hooked permanent tusks erupted, they shifted gradually into the specialized adult role of manipulating branches and stripping bark. 
That stage tusk development supports the idea that juveniles use different feeding strategies than adults and gradually transitioned into the heavy tusked canopy manipulating role. It showed that the bizarre looking skull of the adult wasn't a sudden evolutionary burden. It was a trait the animal eased into over time. Comparisons with modern elephants underline how consistent this pattern is across proboscideans. Elephant calves also begin with milk tusks and replace them though, in their case, the replacements are upper incisors that grow into straight ivory rather than hooked sides. The unique twist with Danotheries was shifting that entire system to the lower jaw, which fundamentally changed how the animals interacted with their environment as they matured. The downward curve only became pronounced once the animal reached a larger body size, a progression captured perfectly in the Hammerschmieder specimen. The find also clarified a broader evolutionary point. For years, some researchers had wondered whether Dinotheres represented a developmental outlier operating under strange growth rules compared to other elephant relatives. But aligning the juvenile specimen with modern elephants showed the opposite. The same basic replacement timing occurred only adapted to fit a different design. Dinotheres were unusual but not biologically incoherent. They shared a recognizable life history plan with their relatives, reinforcing their place within Proboscidea rather than beyond it. Equally important was the ecological context of Hammerschmieder itself. The fossil layers preserve not just Dinotherium levius, but also Tetralophodon, Longirostris, another proboscidean with tusks from both jaws. Their coexistence reveals that Miocene ecosystems often supported several types of elephant relatives, at once each exploiting slightly different diets and habitats, with Dinotherium favoring leaves and Tetralophodon, likely mixing leaves, twigs, and grasses resource partitioning became the key to their survival side by side. For a young dino, the growing its permanent tusks meant gradually stepping into a role already shaped by competition and shared landscapes. Taken together, the Hammerschmieder juvenile offered more than a single anatomical insight. It tied growth patterns, feeding ecology and evolutionary relationships into one coherent picture. Instead of viewing Dinotherium as an evolutionary eccentric, the evidence showed a structured, gradual pathway into the adult condition. It answered one long-standing question about life history while opening a broader mystery that remains, how could such a specialized forest browser manage not only to survive, but also to spread across three continents and persist for millions of years in changing environments? Danotherium's long history is best understood by looking at its geographic reach. Fossils turn up from Western Europe to India and south into Africa, tracing an arc of survival that extended from the Middle Miocene through to the early Pleistocene. For a browser tied to trees that is an enormous range, suggesting that woodlands once stretched across much of the old world, providing essential corridors. While other proboscideans evolved toward flexibility in open country Dinotherium clung to canopies, a strategy that limited it, but also defined its success. Dinotheries grew very large. Some late species reached around 3.6 to 4.0 meters, 11.8 to 13.1 feet at the shoulder, and weighed between nine and 13 tons. And the last surviving species, D. bozasi, held on in East Africa until about one million years ago. In the early Miocene, the environment looked favorable. Tropical forests lined river systems from Spain through South Asia. The combination of neck length trunk and downward curved tusks worked perfectly for pulling down branches and scraping bark in these settings. But by the late Miocene climate, cooling brought less rain, a steady retreat of forests and the rise of open savannas. As forests fragmented and grassy habitats expanded, Dinotherium's dentition and feeding design became mismatched to the new plant base. Its populations gradually failed to adapt to abrasive ground level vegetation, creating the first sustained drop in numbers. At the same time, the ecological landscape became crowded. Proboscideans with high crowned teeth, ancestors of mammoths and modern elephants flourished within the grassy expanses. 
They did not necessarily push Dinotherium out through direct conflict, but they could exploit food sources that the older lineage could not. Over time, this produced an ecological squeeze forest browsers confined to shrinking patches, while grazers and mixed feeders thrived outside. In Europe, the record shows Dinotherium declining first in the north as woodlands receded, then retreating into scattered refuges. Africa, with its river valleys and gallery forests, provided longer lasting shelter, which explains why populations lingered there well after the species had disappeared elsewhere. One notable adaptation during this period was increasing body size. Later, Dinotherium species were dramatically larger than their Miocene ancestors, some tipping toward 14 tons. Researchers interpret this trend as a product of multiple forces deterring predators coping with greater distances between patches of suitable habitat and following predictable Bergman-type patterns in cooling climates. But becoming larger carried an ecological cost. Energy demands grew even as food resources shrank. A massive browser could deter a predator, but it could not thrive on a dwindling diet of leaves in fragmented forests. The very traits that once secured survival gradually became limiting. The best supported explanation in the research is long-term climate-driven habitat change forests shrinking and grasslands expanding. For a tooth and tusk design optimized for stripping leafy branches that meant a narrowing ecological corridor. Competition from more grazing adapted prob proboscideans layered additional pressure. While in Africa, by the early Pleistocene, the presence of early human populations may have introduced further localized stress. Archaeological evidence suggests the possibility of hunting or disturbance at the very least. Yet overall, climate was the heavier hand reshaping entire ecosystems and stripping Dinotherium of the environments it required most. Extinction was not a sudden event. It unfolded as tropical woodlands retreated, food bases dwindled, and alternative elephant relatives occupied the open niches. This interplay of factors does not a single blow account for the gradual fading of a lineage that had otherwise flourished for millions of years. Seen in this frame, the remarkable story is how long it endured across continents despite challenges stacking up over time. That endurance complicates the old image of a crude, terrible beast. Instead, it reminds us that Dinotherium was not a misfit, but a forest specialist that prospered until the world shifted around it. And that sets up its true legacy, a giant finely tuned for its era, whose misunderstood reputation says as much about how we read fossils as about the animal itself. In the end, Dinotherium was not a monster at all, but a long-lived forest specialist shaped for browsing leaves, bark and branches. Its downward curved tusks, flexible neck and distinctive skull made sense once placed in the canopy, not the soil. What makes its story valuable is how science itself changed around it. Early misinterpretations of digging or anchoring gave way to clearer insights once fossils like the juvenile jaw from Hammerschmiede were studied. Each new piece forced a reinterpretation showing how fragile and yet effective narrow adaptations can be. If this kind of paleontological detective work interests you, hit subscribe and tell us what other unsung giants you'd like us to revisit.